Hello, this is Miss Augustine, and we are continuing um, Chapter 6, which is about bonding, and today we're going to talk about ionic bonding, and we're going to talk about formula units and the nature of ionic compounds. So this is ionic bonding, and an ionic compound is defined as something composed of anions and cations combined so that the number of positive and negative charges are equal. And anions are negative ions. Recall, we learned about that in the electron chapter. And so if you've gained electrons, you have a negative charge and you're called an anion. And if you've lost electrons, you have a positive charge and you are called a cation. And you can remember that cations are positive because cats have paws. You can also notice that the word cation has a plus sign in the middle of it. So these ionic compounds are comprised of metal nonmetal bonding. Metals have a tendency to lose electrons and nonmetals have a tendency to gain electrons. Metals have low electronegativity ions have, or nonmetals have high electronegativity. So we uh, represent or show ionic bonding using something called a formula unit, and it shows the lowest whole number ratio of the atoms in an ionic compound. So remember when we talked about covalent compounds, we used a molecular formula. So now for ionic compounds, we use a formula unit and it shows the lowest whole number ratio of anions to cations. So for instance, CaCl2 is the formula for calcium chloride and NaCl is the formula for sodium chloride. So the formula unit is used to represent the formula of an ionic compound and it represents the lowest whole number ratio in that compound. There is no such thing as a molecule of sodium chloride because it exists as a sodium ion and a chloride ion hanging out. And it's because somebody gained the electron chloride and somebody lost the electron sodium. So ionic compounds exist as a collection of positively and negatively charged ions arranged in repeating three-dimensional patterns. So we need to talk about a couple of laws. Remember the law of conservation of matter. We're going to talk about the law of definite proportions and it says that in samples of any chemical compound the masses of the elements are always in the same proportion. Kind of makes sense. If you have a sample of sodium chloride there's always going to be one sodium to every one chlorine. So example magnesium sulfide. A 100 gram sample of magnesium sulfide breaks down to 43.13 grams of magnesium and 56.87 grams of sulfur. So no matter what size sample you have, that ratio of 43.13 to 56.87 of magnesium to sulfur is always the same. And this proportion remains the same whether you have one gram or a million grams. The second law that we talk about is the law of multiple proportions and it says if two or more compounds are composed of the same two elements, the ratio of the masses of the second element combined with a certain mass of the first element is always some ratio of whole numbers. So this goes back to Dalton who said elements combine in simple whole number ratios. So it's a lot of words but if you look carbon and oxygen can form a couple of compounds, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. In the first one, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. In the second one, it's a one-to-two ratio. Same goes for hydrogen and oxygen. They can, conform, they can form more than one compound. In this example, I'm showing you water and peroxide. In water, there's a two-to-one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen and in peroxide there's a 2 to 2 ratio. So again, the point of the law of multiple proportions is that no matter how elements combine, the ratios will always be some small whole number. So now with ionic compounds, it's important to note that whenever we talk about a compound, we're referring to a neutral substance. 
So that means that when you're combining a cation and an anion, the charges have to result in a neutral compound. So whatever the charge of the plus thing is added to the charge of the minus thing ends up being zero. So if we had A with a plus one and X with a minus one, the compound would be neutral because plus one minus one is zero. The charge of the cation and the anion must add up to zero. So now we'll talk about some properties of ionic compounds. They have these 3D repeating patterns and their characteristics are high melting points. They are conductive when they're melted in their molten state. They exist typically in crystalline form when they're solids. They have a tendency to dissolve in water and they produce electrical conductivity when they're dissolved in water. So if you have a solution of pure water, it doesn't conduct electricity. If you dump some sodium chloride into it, it will conduct electricity because the sodium ions and the chloride ions will conduct the charge. And then we talk about a coordination number, and that gives the number of ions of opposite charge that surround each ion in the crystal of a ionic compound, an ionic compound. So if we think about sodium chloride, it has a coordination number of six. And this is what it looks like. So what this is telling me is that surrounding each of these ions are six oppositely charged ions. So now let's talk about ionic charges. So for group A metals, and the A elements are the representative elements, so I'm talking about S and P block. So for the A group metals, if you're in group 1A, the alkali metals, you have a charge of plus one when you form an ion. And if you're a group 2A and you form an ion, you have a plus two. And group 3A metals, <clears throat> and that now we're close to the line of demarcation. We're um, only going to concern ourselves with aluminum, so a group 3A metal would form a plus three ion. And then for the non-metals, once we cross the line of demarcation, the charge is determined by subtracting eight from the group number. So a group 7A element would have a charge of minus one. Group 7A elements form negative one ions. So we're talking about the group A non-metals. And again, we've crossed the line of demarcation. So if you're in group 5A, which is the nitrogen family, you're in group five, so five minus eight, nitrogen forms a negative three ion. If you're in the group six A um, portion of the periodic table, that's the oxygen family, oxygen and sulfur that are both in group six A, their charge is gonna be six minus eight, so it's negative two. If you're in seven A, the halogens, the charge is seven minus eight minus one. And if you're in group zero or 8A, so that's the noble gases, they don't typically form ions. <clears throat> and again, group 4A, which is the carbon family, they also don't usually form ions. So group eight noble gases and group 4A nonmetals tend to form molecular compounds. Other ions that we talk about are the polyatomic ions. And these are ions that are made up of more than one atom. And the atoms within a polyatomic ion are covalently bonded, but they have a net negative charge, typically. There are a few positive ones, but in general, they are carrying a negative charge. They behave like atoms, they're tightly bound groups, and they're very common and stable in nature. And they all have special names. <clears throat> and one that we like to talk about, the one that we'll talk about with a positive charge, is ammonium ion, and its formula is NH4+. So when you're talking about the polyatomic ions, most end in ite or eight, their names, and they typically contain oxygen as well. Exceptions are ammonium, which is NH4+, and it ends in IUM instead of ite or eight. Hydroxide, Again, OH- minus is the ion, and its name doesn't end in ite or eight. And cyanide, which is uh, carbon bonded to nitrogen, and again, a negative charge. So the polyatomic ions with hydrogen, example would be hydrogen carbonate, 
<coughs> you have the H plus ion with a carbonate ion. And so the net charge of the new ion is the sum of the two. So plus one minus two, the net charge is minus one. And ionic compounds, for all ionic formulas, the positive charge of the cation must balance the negative charge of the anion. So the net ionic charge of a formula is always zero. And for that, I'm going to leave it off right now. So this is Ms. Augustine, and that's all we're going to talk about with ionic compounds for the moment. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.